first speaker is Uma, as we talk about extending uh, the limits. And he will start soon. After the final state of what he wants to reach 
not only mind, can really express it and can, for instance, store it in Git and, and everyone can more or less easily understand what the final state is of the user's mind. And with the operator who does all the work for the user. Here you again you see the user and in the red surf you see what the user now has to do in the system. He just, just posts the state of what's going in the system and he doesn't care about all the intermediate states. And uh, here is an example of how such states can be expressed in Kubernetes. I'm working on Kubert. That's an extension for Kubernetes which allows you to manage virtual machines. And we were creating a virtual machine extension to Kubernetes. And here you see a, a, a description of a virtual machine. As you see in the kind, it's a virtual machine object. It's here. You can specify how much memory it has. You can attach this to the virtual machine. And and reference the system volume plane, which is the empty disk we want. And then you can just create an ordinary system volume, volume plane in the typical Kubernetes YAML format. And in this case, we, will, we want a disk with 8 gigabytes. And you post those two YAMLs to the cluster, and then the operator starts doing all the work for you. It fetches the YAMLs, it creates the disks, waits for the disks to be there, creates the game, starts the game. Much easier for a user, but now we engineers have to deal with the complexity. So it's not it's not going away; it's just somewhere else. And that brings me finally to the part where we can talk about how Kubernetes solves that problem. And Kubernetes has some basic considerations when it uh, comes to writing controllers. One is we have a cluster state, and we are trying to follow that cluster state. So we're not, Kubernetes is not trying to, uh, but we're just, we're not following every state of the cluster. We're just trying to converge to the final state we want to reach. So, I don't know, you get virtual machine update events, you see you have to react on them, and you just try to adapt the cluster to it, but you don't guarantee that you are going through every mutation of the object. It's just, you guarantee at the end you will read the desired state. And, and this has, has advantages when you think about how Kubernetes controllers store the state, uh, react on the state of the cluster, because they have an in-memory view, a cache view of the cluster, and they can't, and, and with that consideration that you don't have to process every state, they can have some very nice simplifications <laughs> to reach the final state. Um, the first thing you have to do when you want to create a controller to Kubernetes is you need access to the data and create your in-memory view. And the first construct that have here is a so-called list watcher. And that's an actually very simple construct. Here you see the interface to the machine go. Um, you have two methods on it. First, a list call, which just does a REST call and lists your research, lists all the delivery services for the calls. And then you have to watch all. So after you've listed all pods, you start watching for changes in the pods. Kubernetes has a very nice watch API where it just opens a web socket and you get all the updates of the pods. And since it uses ETT in the back, it can leverage the ETT's resource version function, or the function resource version field. Whenever you mutate an object in the ETT cluster, it gets a specific resource version. And you can start watching directories based on a specific resource version. That's what the, what the watch function reuses. And when you look at an implementation of such a list watcher, the result is therefore pretty simple. Um, you see here a function which creates a new list for the client. Um, first, we create a list function which needs to return. We can, oh yeah, that's something I should mention. Um, all I'm talking here, all those constructs are not just internally used by Kubernetes. Kubernetes guys really made a great work of, did a great work of creating an extra Go SDK, which is directly synchronized out of the core repository. Uh, all code snippets you see here are using core code from Kubernetes, but through the Kubernetes SDK. So you can just fetch the SDK and write your controllers the same way like the core Kubernetes contributors are doing. And here you see the result of it. I'm just using a default REST client from the default REST client from the Kubernetes core repo here. Um, 
build a reservoir and and fetch all resources from the endpoint. And for the watch functionality, I'm doing pretty much the same. I am creating the right rest path to the watch for every few weeks, a specified machine spaces to look for, a specified watch resources that can be pods, virtual machines, or whatever your extension is. Add some extra parameters, you don't have to care about them, actually, you just add them. You can specify field selectors, so that, that helps you to say my controllers really just care about specifically in ports, not all ports in the cluster, and you start watching. And then, that's it, you just return it, and you have a list watcher, which lists and watches, and emits an update or delete events for your object. That's the first step. Now we could already think, hey, now I get all the events coming in from my controller, um, why not just take that event channel I get from Go and do my business logic now based on those events? And that's not a very good idea. First of all, controllers can have more than one resource. Um, then it's hard to, to combine all the events properly because you get from resource A an event for object, for object X and from resource B you get an event for object Y and you don't really have a place to correlate them, to look at them together. The second thing is um, the list watchers don't provide any retry mechanisms or anything. So they're really just good at one thing, but they're very good about emitting events of changes in the cluster and showing you which resources are there in the cluster. The next thing here to get part of the tool with creating a full controller is introducing a store. The stores can now help you by taking the events from the list watches from different sources and, and fill different stores <coughs> with the objects which are emitted by the list watcher. And now you have a place to store your in-memory view of your cluster. A store is a, uh, is a single write amount of the reader constructing who it is. Uh, internally, it's mostly simple memory-based map. And you have a few simple methods on how to add stuff and how to, uh, how to access stuff. Basically, you can add up the OTD objects, in this case, and plus. They are entered, entered to the store. And uh, I have a few different ways of getting the objects out. One is, for instance, get by key. Uh, typically, typically key in Kubernetes consists of the name of the object and the namespace it is in. So here I'm trying to get the, the pod of pod 1 in the default namespace, and I get the object out of the variable. There are just other methods like list, principal content of the cache. And here we can see the full interface that implements edge up in the So it's simple list to get all the object list please to just get the objects which are in get to check if an object is in the cache which I already have or get back to get pretty simple and now we're already a little bit farther now we can fetch the state from the uh, so now we can fetch resource changes from the cluster with the list watcher and we, we can use the store to create an in-memory view of the cluster and Kubernetes helps us in farther um, now they introduce a shared index <coughs> informer which takes the list watcher and the store and makes sure that the list watcher updates the store for you and it allows you to register the callbacks and these callbacks are also very simple it's add update they need callbacks and whenever an event is coming in from the list watcher it will try to call the callbacks since the shared um, here is a very interesting cycle. A shared informer does not guarantee that when an event is coming in and your callbacks are triggered, that you are. Oh, yeah, here I, I probably better show you the picture where you can see the entity and update signatures. So when a list watcher updates the store and the shared informer then removes the callbacks, it will, for instance, call you add method if an object was added and it will provide you with the object which was triggering the update but the interesting sign of here is that you are not guaranteed to see the, the object state which was coming in by the list watcher and which was triggering your callback um, maybe I'll try to explain once again to make sure that you really, that you really get it. That's, it it's not that hard but a little bit hard to express um, so 
there can be two or three very fast updates on the same object. And you can have many callbacks in the shared program. So it can be that a part of the callbacks were invoked after the first update of the object was coming in. In the meantime, two new updates are coming in for the same object and the cache is updated. But the callbacks were not even invoked for the first event yet. So what the shared component does is providing the latest state from the cache to the object. And that's, very, that's a very neat idea to reuse the shared informer for as many callbacks as possible without having that overhead of tracking all the different states parallel. And you can still reach the goal of, of reaching the final state which you want. Also, you're not processing every object mutation. Um, here's an example of how such callbacks can be implemented for a shared informer. And you just create a resource event handler function struct, add an add function, update function, delete function, and in there you can take the object and operator. Um, again, now you, can, now you might think, hey, now we're there, right? We have the shared informer with the callbacks, we have the store, the in memory view. Now we can put our business logic in here in this <coughs> update, update and delete functions. But no, not a good idea. First of all, the shared informer involves locks, and there is something very interesting with locks internally. If, if, you are, if you are locking, some, if, if a go routine locks for a very long time, and for instance, business logic normally takes a lot of time, and, and you have the same go routine already trying to acquire the lock immediately after the scan, the, the other go routine which acquires the lock just for a very short amount of time, doesn't get the lock. So you would end up with reprocessing over and over the callback code, but never updating your cache, which also needs the lock. And that's, therefore, this callback needs to be very short because of the code limitation or go architectural decisions. I don't want to judge that. And the, second, <laughs> and the next thing is, as you can see, the callbacks here, they just take an object but return nothing. So. There is again no place to do error handling here in, a, in the same way. No retry mechanism or anything. But what you can do now here is you can use the callbacks to main queue the key of the object which changed to a work queue. And the work queue is the final missing piece which will help us. A work queue at first glance looks like a completely typical queue implementation. You get something, you have an object in, you get something out, you get the object out. The same order like first in first order. But it has a few optimizations which make writing the process very convenient. The first one is, and I'll show you details after I went through the list of all those cases, if, if you get multiple updates for the same object, they're all collapsed into one edit key, so you don't end up processing every mutation. It just collapses over the key so you don't have to process so you don't wake up the queue five times if you, because it's just not necessary. Um, the work queue internally knows when a, when a key is processed on and when you're done with processing. And that allows the work queue to make sure that you don't have to care about locking on keys so that you don't process the same key or the same object in parallel in different workers. The queue does that for you. Um, it allows mechanisms to re-enqueue uh, the key you're currently processing in case of errors, it allow, even allows you to specify uh, retry policies and backup policies. And, and that, is, that is why it also has a history of re in case of errors. If we now go through the list in more detail, first, the thing where it looks like a normal map, you have your queue, it contains a queue system pod 2 pod and a default pod 1 pod. And you want to add a default pod 2 pod key. And the result is like expected equal add. And it's just added in the back of the queue. And you have three keys in there now. But you already see the difference when you already have an a key in the queue. And you try to add the same key again. Then that's perfectly valid. But you, the result will still just contain two queues. So it's piece. So you can enqueue a key just once, and that's all you need because you don't, since you have a cache with the latest in-memory view of the cluster, you, don't, you, you can't even process every object mutation. So you're just interested in detecting, okay, it has to change, and I need to process it. 
Um, and if I didn't yet process it, it, it's good enough to just have it marked as I need to process it. I don't need to mark it as process it five times. It doesn't mean I can see back different cache in the same way. And the cube also makes sure for you that you don't have to care about processing the same key in parallel multiple times. That could lead to strange race conditions. Just consider you you try you have a a replica set which should create five pods. And 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 you have two updates on the replica set for creating the pods, so it's saying two two times. And uh, you can de it first and then uh, de it in another work again. So both are trying to work on these changes and both are trying to create five pods for you. At the end, you have ten pods, and then over time, they probably adjust and start deleting them again, and at the end, you end with five. But you would have to take care of yourself about what you can work to that by, by tracking which keys you you got from the queue. So when you do a get on default port, when, you, when you do a get and you get the default for one key out, and you add the default for one key again and do another get in another worker, you get nothing out of the queue, although there is something in the queue. Only if you are done with processing and call done on the queue with the key, another get will give you the object. And now we get to the the very important error handling capabilities. Uh, if you are getting a key out of the queue and you're processing it and you have errors, you want to reprocess it. But normally you don't want to immediately reprocess it, or for maybe the first time you want to immediately reprocess it, but not if it fails five times. Oh, and um, yeah, it should be driven in five minutes. <laughs> so what do you want to do? You want to add a key rate limit so that this doesn't immediately get out again. And and here you see it. So we, we are processing the event. Uh, we have an error. We are processing the key. We have an error, and we add it rate limited again. It gets enqueued again into the key. But and when I immediately do a get afterwards, it gives me nothing out. Only after a specific delay, which can be an exponential vector for whatever, for every every rate limited call, you get the object out. Again. That's the very same pattern. Do not worry about this. And here is the final consideration which you take, need to take into account. And that is uh, the queue internal also tracks the failure history. So if you call five times at rate limited for the same key, you can wait five times. Then, uh, then the queue internally tracks five times error, and that's important, for instance, to calculate a backup. And when you then finally manage to do a successful process processing of that key. You have to add an extra forget call for the key to make sure that the server is really gets the object and it gets normally added in the meter. Okay. Maybe you just need a work interface, it contains all the methods I've been talking about before. And now we're at the end pretty much, because now with all those components we can create a controller. And um, the controller uses the list watcher and the informer and, and the store to provide the clusters. Uh, in memory view, it uses the callbacks of the informer to add the keys to the verb queues. Uh, the controller has, a, has worker loops running which use get to dequeue keys from the queue. If there are errors, it uses add rate limited to add the key again for later processing. On success, you have to make sure that you forget error history if you had one, and you have to call done so that uh, other workers can work on the key, on the key again. Here we have a nice picture which does that too, uh, which illustrates the two. On the left side, you see the shared informer again, the callback of the informer into the work queue. Here you have the controller coroutines. They are using the proper get call to get the keys out of the work queue and, and based on the key they fetch, they fetch from the stores from the informer. Now they have everything, they have access to the objects and to the key they need to process, and they can react to changing the cluster with doing extra rest calls like creating calls or whatever. And depending if something was a success or an error, they can put and call the right calls in the group you have to so these calls are done, forget at very limited, at or something like that. And I don't know how much time is left. Uh,
three minutes? Okay, then it's perfect to to go and the do's and don'ts again, which we, which we collected during the talk. And so here the list watches are really just there for updating stores. Don't even try to to react to the events they're providing directly. There's just no code out there in the is to, to proper product error in the or anything. Use stores to get the latest state of the known object and don't try to manipulate the cache directly. Let's share the formats do that for you. Um, it's a read only it's a single reader multiple read, a single write multiple read implementation. If you and you don't even have access to the logs. So don't try to do that. Uh, then Copy objects from the store before you try to manipulate them. When you get an object from the store, uh, you just get a reference to the object in the cache. So if you're directly, for instance, taking a pod out, manipulating it, and want to update it on the cluster, you're also manipulating your cache. But the cache should be updated based on the state of the cluster and not based on your mutation directly. So you first need to decopy it. So we need to test some performance generated deep copy functions for that. Um, and when you use shared informers, don't use the callbacks for doing your business logic. Just use them for for notify work queues about changes. And finally, that's a very interesting one. Don't in Kubernetes you normally have the object with the specification and the status in one place. So don't try when you, for instance, have a pod. Uh, a, a replica set which should create five pods. Don't try to implement it the way that you say, okay, now I, now I created five pods, so I immediately also update my status to have five pods and push it. Push it. What you will see is that you, that your pod count will start to, to go up and down random, pretty much randomly, because the in-memory view of the cluster did not yet recognize that you have created that pods, and it does not yet know that there are five new pods. Maybe just these three pods on the next update because the next creation events didn't even reach it yet. So your status will just behave very strange. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Here are, here are the links for interesting to see your actual implementations and uh, how Kubernetes and, and, and Kubernetes guide. And there is even more, but it's just like the full time. For instance, uh, reference management, managing of objects, uh, talking about, and we also talk about uh, garbage collection and all that <coughs> stuff. Also, uh, yeah, I'm the, uh, Okay, thank you. So, if you want to be down, please be quiet. Very quiet, please, so we can have you.